views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello and welcome to the second episode of our home, Our Haven, Safe Streets, BronxNet's Forum on Preventing Gun Violence. Community plays a big role on preventing gun violence, so today we talk to community leaders who work on the ground with families and at-risk individuals. Together we further explore the root causes of gun violence and how to address them. What inspires people to help? Is it policy enacted by elected officials? Is it programs offered by community organizations? Is it individuals who have lived the life, sharing lessons with others at risk of engaging in violence? Or is it parents, teachers, and social workers? Uh, joining us are Gloria Alfines, therapeutic service provider at Release the Grip, RTG, Gilberto Gili Delgado, community liaison of Guns Down, Life Up, and David Cava, vice president at Bronx Rises Against Gun Violence. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I read in my notes that uh, there's a, a, a common thread among you all. You are all uh, credible messengers and violence disruptors or interrupters. interrupters. Can you tell me what's that? So a violence interrupter is one who, like there's many here, or I should say these two and many throughout the Bronx who are on the ground working um, to interrupt violence that may occur. There's a possibility of some kind of conflict going on. And men and women who work in these cure violence programs are there to intervene, um, intercept, and be able to work through what the issue is before uh, a gun is used um, among other weapons. The fact that you're all credible messengers, what does that mean? A credible messenger is one who speaks the language of the neighborhoods and is still part of the community and also was a product of the environment and lived that life as well. So it's, it's more like a translator, someone who can intervene and speak the language of the, of the neighborhood, of the community. So it has been proven that one of uh, the best antidotes to violence is to have people from local communities, peers who have had experience, talk to people rather than um, talking with people rather than talking at. That's right, to or at, that is correct. Now, there, you uh, do very similar work with uh, some differences uh, in between here and there, but uh, in terms of the violence interruption component, you work uh, of a structure, uh, a way, a method, called Cure Violence. We were talking a little bit about it off camera. It was implemented in Chicago successfully, and it has three pillars. Uh, what are those? So the three pillars of the Cure Violence model that came out of Chicago, um, started in Chicago in 2000 and came here to New York in 2010, is designed to do three things. Number one is to interrupt conflicts, mediate those on the spot. That means it, late at night in the communities that we serve, in the different spots where the action is happening. The second part of the model is to identify high-risk youth, those young individuals, usually the age 16 to 25, who are engaged in these high-risk activities, bring them into the program, teach them how to handle conflicts in a peaceful way, and move them in the right direction. And the third one, which in my estimation is like the long-term approach to the cure violence model, is to mobilize the community to reject the violence. Communities that have been inundated with gun violence for decades think that it's a norm to see people shooting each other and stabbing each other and don't seem to realize that it's abnormal and needs to change. The cure violence model is a public health approach. So basically, violence behaves like a contagion that spreads, it clusters, and needs to be stopped. Talking a little bit about your respective organizations, uh, let's begin with you, um, Gloria. What do you guys do at RTG? Um, at RTG, there's so many different components at RTG, but we also have violence interrupters and uh, outreach workers who are working on the ground um, having uh, in, bring in youth to be able to get them work, education, whatever supports they may need, um, wraparound service for the entire family that they might 
be something happening at home that we don't know about and bringing them in and having that conversation with them allows us to see what's going on, how can we service them and meeting them where they're at. Um, my job in particular, I work throughout the Bronx and I will meet a number of different um, individuals throughout the Bronx that may need some kind of service, may need a referral of some sort. It doesn't limit myself to a specific sector as the men and women that I work with have to work in a specific area, which is their catchment, because that's where their target area is. Whereas for myself, I'm able to mo be mobile through the mobile trauma or therapeutics unit to go out throughout the Bronx and service families at any part of the Bronx um, and talk to them, see what's going on with them, uh, talk to local politicians and connect with them and say, hey, we have a family here. A lot of families are suffering in silence. They're not really going out on the street and say, I need help. You know, it's very hard for some of us to ask for help, nonetheless, to get the help. We have a lot of doors that are being slammed in our face telling us that we can't get this, we can't get that. And so my job is to sh make sure that some way, somehow, these families are being serviced. How about you, David? Sure. Um, BRAG, Bronx Rise Against Gun Violence, is um, part of Good Shepherd Services, also part of the New York City Crisis Management System. So we share the same model. Uh, BRAG is in the Western Bronx, the Northwest Bronx, and the North Bronx, where we are now. And we operate three cure violence teams in these areas, in the worst parts um, in these uh, communities, and using violence interrupters, outreach workers, uh, supervisors. But we also are strategic in how we approach this model in terms of what's connected to it. So for example, it's not just the Bragg Cure Violence programs, but it's also the Bragg Hospital Response programs. So we work out of St. Barnabas Hospital, we work out of Jacoby Hospital. We also have the um, Bragg Music Recording Studio. So one of the things that young people are into is music and hip hop. And so when you tell them to put the weapon down, you gotta be able to have them pick something else up, such as a mic, pro tools, instruments, things of that nature. We also have Bragg Boxing because they have a lot of energy, right? Unfortunately, a lot of aggression too. We teach them the science and the art of boxing and how it basically teaches you some discipline, right? And to learn that it's for self-defense purposes that aggression should be used, if at all. But we also have the Bragg uh, Anti-Gun Violence Employment Program, so you understand summer youth. Well, our summer youth doesn't just run in the summer. It runs in the fall, and it runs in the winter, and it runs in the spring. Uh, when they get home from school at 3 p.m. and mom is not home, what are they doing for those couple of hours? So we have about 50 young people engaged with us and other community-based organizations learning, something that they may end up doing in the future because they feel that they like this type of work. We also have our education vocation component. When young people come in, where are they at educationally? Do they need to be re-engaged? Are they a little older and school is not really an option, but they need to be in apprenticeship or some sort of training program that leads to a full-time employment at the end of that? And then later we can re-engage them back in school, right? Because that, that is a key component to all of that. All of our programs are strategically designed to approach the kids. Ah, I remember. Schools. Schools. Our BRAG DOE program which is something very, very big for us because as a second grader, I was already involved in that lifestyle. Second grade. And so we're currently in middle school or in high schools. We really want to also be in elementary schools because we want to make sure that those young people, if they're going to look up to someone, it should be our staff, our members that went to those same schools, remember the same teachers, know which bathrooms are the, you know, suspicious bathrooms, that type of thing. And so we're very strategic in everything that we do. We want to make sure that if they end up in the hospital, that our hospital responses are there. If they're starting to get in that lifestyle in school, that we're in the schools. If they left school and they need to be reengaged, that so we got them there. But also, are they interested in the arts? Are they interested in athletics? And we get them with the boxing and with the music studio. How about you, Gilly? Well, uh, our program is called Guns Down Life Up, Lincoln Hospital. We're a hospital-based program under the Cure Violence System, uh, but we're hospital-based. So what we do is we track the gas report, which is called the gunshot, assault, and stab wounds. Um, we, uh, we, we have a pager with Trauma One. So just a quick example, uh, when the ambulance comes for the victim, the police come for the crime scene, but who's there for the brother that wants to retaliate? Who's there for the mom that does not understand what happened to her, their child? Uh, so what we do is we mediate that situation. We're all under the same pillar. So, you know, we, we, we focus on intervention, prevention, and community mobilization. Uh, we also pay for caskets. We also uh, 
move families out. Uh, Guns Down Life Up, we do have a, a winter and summer youth program through the mayor's office called the Anti-Gun Violence Program, where we idolize the kids' time. We've already serviced over 150 kids. Uh, we have court and pro we have court mandates and probation mandates that are mandated to our program. We too uh, emphasize in sports, basketball, boxing. Uh, we have music. Uh, we do. We have a music studio that we go to, and uh, we focus on fashion. Uh, we do a reentry program. Uh, we deal with mental health because obviously we're in the hospital. So um, and then we also violence interrupted, so we're kind of on, on both sides of the, of the sword here. So we actually service the, the victim, but we also try to help the perpetrator as much as we can due to the fact that we know it's a mental health issue. The kind of work that you all do, um, why do we need it in the way that you do it specifically? First and foremost, in order to communicate um, with the youth, you got to meet them where they're at. You got to be able to speak the same language, if not know. These men here and so many more have been there personally. They know what road it's going to lead down, what they need to do to make a change. Why is this so important? How much gun violence have been in throughout just the Bronx? I don't even want to name the other boroughs because it just goes on and on. But in actuality, if we don't talk to our youth and let them be heard. How are we going to understand what's going on with them? And at the same, how important these programs are. We talk about the word resources and, and community does not always understand that, right? As being a word of help. They're, they're naming different programs and things that are going on within these programs that is so much that these kids need and more. They need to be working, they need to be engaged, they need to be supervised, they need to be talked to, they need to be mentored. These men and women do that work, but it's so much more needed. That's why um, our program is expanding, their programs are expanding, because they're seeing it as like, hey, we're on to something. Violence is not the way. We find other ways of dealing with you so that they can break down that stigma. Oh, let's, let's go and choose violence as a way to show that I own this street or I belong here and you don't. The problem is, is that if we allow community to continue to keep seeing that as something as acceptable, when we know that that is not normal, that normalizing is like, hey, let's take a swim. Let's show you how to cook. Let's talk about the things that are going on that the kid may need that he doesn't talk about, right? That he doesn't go to school because he doesn't have a pair of sneakers to go to school. And that, you know, something is going on. Maybe mom is sick. They don't talk about those things. And the need for these kids to get involved in so many things. Maybe they never left the Bronx. Maybe they never saw a Broadway show. Maybe there are things that they never were exposed to. Maybe dad isn't alive. These programs are so necessary and needed, and we want our kids to grow and thrive. We want them to grow up in the world and be someone, not in the ground, not in jail, not out there killing each other, but loving each other as brother and sister. And that's why these men and women that work in these programs are so necessary and needed, because we want our kids to live. Just as in episode one of this uh, forum series, uh, the theme of a, of, a, of a thorough, round approach to prevent um, violence seems to have come up. Uh, how can we bridge this? How, how is this possible to put all these pieces together, all these components, education, mental health care access, um, other programs other, that fulfill other needs? So when, when you uh, started earlier, you mentioned one of the many reasons why in individuals or groups get involved in this work. It's, it's everybody. It's not just the person with lived experience. It's not just a social worker. It's not just the elected official. It's not just law enforcement or the criminal. It's everyone. Everyone takes an approach. What I can tell you about what it is that we do is that, you know, it's, we are from the community. And so we are the solutions to the community issues, community solutions for community issues. We grew up there, we still live there. My grandmother still goes to the church in that same block. My, my kids still go to the school in that neighborhood. I'm going to uh, you know, parent-teacher night, you know what I mean, with my daughter's teachers in that same neighborhood, right? And so I know what's going on there. At the end of the day, 
Big Brother and Big Sister mentoring is critical for our young people. They, they have to talk to somebody that can say to them, I know what it's like not to be able to have something to eat tonight. I know what it's like not to have money to pay to get on the train, to go to school or, or, or to even your summer youth employment, right? Because they don't pay you in advance, right? That, that those are issues. So while social workers do what they do and electors do what they do, they can go to areas that we can go to late at night. In fact, we actually get invited to those areas. We actually, that's our playground. Like, we're, that's where we're used to going. You know, other people are used to going to, um, uh, to the movies, you know, or to a restaurant. We go to the spots. Like, that's where we live. That's where we know everybody. That's where, you know, um, we get something to drink, you know, spend some time, talk, you know, uh, what's going on in the community and neighborhood. But what happens in those, those spots is that sometimes a dispute takes place. And that's, that dispute can snowball. It can turn into something. And so as credible messengers and violent interrupters in these spots when this is happening at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning, they could easily turn into a violent trauma. We're there and diffuse that. We mediate that conflict and get them to uh, come to an understanding so that nobody has to be hurt in the first place. And so this is where we, where we are unique in what, it, in what it is that we do. No other profession can do this. They, they wouldn't even know the first thing about um, what spot to go to in a particular neighborhood. If I go to Gilly's neighborhood, he's gonna tell me, when we're walking around here, that's where the dice is flowing day, that's where the money's moving, you know, those kind of things, right? And that, that's what makes us unique. At the end of the day, we have an issue in this country where our young people are involved in uh, on an ongoing basis and an increased basis with violence and guns. And there was a time where drug addiction was the same kind of issue. Well, we have this now. Now you have drug programs all over the place. We need our programs in many different areas of each of the neighborhoods that we, we work in and we live in. This issue is not going to go anywhere overnight. Uh, you're civilians. Do you at any moment feel unsafe doing this kind of work, going around the spots very uh, early in the morning, the wee hours of the morning before dawn? I mean, the thought comes up, but, you know, we're a product of our environment, so it's, it's, it's a norm for us of what we see. So um, it's actually rewarding to me because, like, I was about to piggyback off what David said, like, to be a great mentor, you have to be a great listener. So you have to listen to what the community is saying, not what is dictated to you. It's how we want you. We want you to do this, that, that. No, we have to ask the community at large, what is it that you guys need to uplift your community to make it better? Well, we need the community centers open. We need more jobs. We need more trades. We need more training. We need more OSHA classes so we can start pushing the buck and then have, have everything in rotation. And that's what we are here for. We're here to guide those because we weren't guided we didn't have any of this growing up we did see drug programs we grew up in the heroin era where all we saw was heroin addicts and programs with methadone programs so now we fast forward 2022 drugs is not the ideal problem in america gun violence is so now we need more and more gun violence programs mm -hmm. to open up and to put the same energy as they did in those drug programs but with an advanced level because you have more experience you can't teach this in a school mm -hmm. you can have 20 college degrees you cannot teach going into the community and say hey bro hey sis come on let's think about what we're doing why because we've been there and they know that they know the history of most of us They've heard stories, so they say, man, wow, the, the, you know, the G made it, mama made it, maybe I got a shot at this. So mm -hmm. they give us an opportunity. Uh, Gilly and David, I know at one moment in your lives, uh, your life, you them, yourselves had to make a choice about what path you were going to take. What made you turn around? Just surviving it. Surviving traumatic situations where you thought you weren't going to come home or you got sit in a cage for a little while and you thought you weren't going to come out. So, you know, most people say, is this the life I want to live? A conscious mind would say, is this what I want to live? Uh, a person that doesn't have a care for himself is not going to have a care for life. So you have to care and love yourself to be able to love your people. So we love ourselves and then we love our people because like David said, 
this is our land. This is our country. We, there's nowhere else for us to go but in the Bronx. We're born and raised here in the Bronx, so we have to fix our Bronx. Yeah, um, I think Gilly hit it on the head. Um, but everybody has, you know, their own personal experiences. Um, you know, being in a cage or being on a gurney in the ER with, you know, blood gushing out of you, not knowing if you're going to make it. Um, those, those can be reasons. <laughs> Uh, that didn't stop me. Um, what's, what got me to think was when they killed my niece, she was like, a, she's a baby. Um, and then my older brother, her father, went on a mission. And my last conversation with him was, you know, they're going to end you, you know. And he's like, you shouldn't be around me no more because you're going to get caught up in that, you know, the collateral damage we hear a lot about. That kind of thing. And then they, they got him at four in the morning. And watching him in a box and being put in the ground, I already did two out of the three. I didn't want to check that last box off. You know, last thing is see my mom, you know, going through that. Um, and that's when, I, that's when I decided, okay, if I don't cut, cut it out, you know, you ain't, I won't be around anymore, all right? There's no doubt that gun violence is increasing. Uh, you have mentioned uh, like a menu of programs that exist. Um, what else do we need in terms of programs? What, what do we need to see that we're not seeing yet, if anything? Well, my, my thing is, is schools, um, big time. Thank you. The school to prison pipeline is real, all right? You go into a school, and we're in five schools right now high school, middle schools, right? You go into these schools and it's almost like going into a penitentiary. There's metal detectors, there's wands, there's security. I mean, the walls are made of concrete. I mean, you know. Fluorescent lights. Uh, fluorescent lights, yet you get called to the, to the superintendent. I mean, the principals are. <laughs> the, 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 cafeteria, the cafeteria is the mess hall. You gotta get your tray. Stand on the line, they hit your tray up, they give you the milk, you walk to the end, you sit down, mm -hmm. get your table. If you're not my friend, you're not in my grade, you can't sit in that table. Mm -hmm. If you're a nerd or you're a jock or you're somebody else, or you know, now right. we're, right, so now we're in a new era where, you know, we, we have transgender people, so now they're not even, uh, you know, wanted alike. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's like interracism within interracism on every level. And believe it or not, a lot of that lifestyle begins in school. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, in second grade, I was already head banging, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and so the, 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 the idea is, is to get them as early as possible. So Gilly mentioned right away prevention, right? Well, how do you prevent? Get in those, get in those grammar schools. You got to get in those grammar schools before they hit middle school. Because once they start hitting middle school, the recruitment starts happening, the extortion starts, the bullying starts happening those type of things. When we first started, we approached principals to try to get into the schools and they looked at us suspiciously, right? Because we kind of, you know, we're the community, we're them, right? Now, wait a minute, I'm not bringing you to our school. <laughs> so we decided to post up right outside the schools. Why? Because we knew that that's when the crews would come in and they were gonna recruit, put arm on the sh over the shoulder of a kid, walk them to the bus, maybe get them a slice, and start providing some of those basic needs that they're normally supposed to get from a parent or older sibling or something like that. And that's how they bring you in, mm -hmm. right? And so they see us out there, we talk to them, it's not in this school, not here, you know, fall back, there's other schools. And so we, we stopped all the extortion, the bullying, the fighting, you name it. There came a moment where the parents and the school uh, teachers ended up explaining to the principals and the vice principals it's safer outside of our schools than it is inside. Fast forward, now we're in schools, we're contracted to be there. That's what needs to grow. We need to be in every one of these schools so that we can see a future where there's no longer magnets, there's no longer wands, there's no longer a need for security. Our school conflict mediation specialists are credible messengers that actually went to those schools went to those bathrooms that you're not supposed to go to, to the locker room, you're not supposed right. to go to high school, those kind of things. They know where the action is. They know which teachers the students like and don't like. They know the food. They know how to talk, just like in the streets, except it's in the, it's in the schools. 
that's what I think needs to grow. We're not in enough schools, and if we get them early enough, or we get them, you know, in grammar school before they get to middle school, watch what happens in terms of gang lifestyle, street lifestyle, violent organizations, they will diminish. Well, you know, just piggybacking off what David said, too, that we all work together. Um, when, when, when you get in trouble in the school, the first thing they, they tell you is you're going to detention. Mm -hmm. So you're already incarcerated. They already mm -hmm. programmed it in your brain. Yeah. So we are also in the schools, the Guns Down Life Up. Um, so what, what we do is we, 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 we're working on having our own offices, and that's what he's talking about. In our school, instead of sending the kid to detention, we'll bring him to intervention and work on his psyche and help him out because we speak his language. Also, Guns Down Life Up, we have the writer from Sesame Street. He's actually one of the puppeteers. He wrote a book called The Gun Is Not Fun. So it's, 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 uh, it's for the pre-kindergarten kid on his way up because we have to go that far down now because the, the idea was from 16 to 25 years old was the problem. And then it went from 13 to 24. And then now it's at eight to 16. So in a minute, it's gonna be six to 13 year olds that we have to, so we need to get in the psyche early. And that's what we are here to do. So we need more prevention and intervention than detention. So it's early, very early intervention. Yes, uh, Gloria, is there anything that you see in terms of programs and resources that we need to see yet we are not? I think one of the things before I started working for um, RTG, uh, I was in the streets on the grounds with families in their apartments. Um, one of the things I was doing was volunteering my time to deal with uh, families who had children with special needs and um, affording that, telling them, affording them their rights. You have the right to ask for certain things, or services, but families didn't know that they had their rights. They didn't know that there were things that they could have asked for in order to utilize services for their kids. So either kids were quitting school fighting in school because it was about behavior and not about education. So the focus wasn't on teaching them or giving them the tools that they need. Now I remember working at one school and I spent 60 to 80 hours a week volunteering. And I remember that they divided the school because now the public school was downstairs and then upstairs was a charter school. So the funding is different, of course. But then to see the difference between two floors, because I've walked throughout that whole building um, talking to teachers and talking to children and knowing the difference between the funding of how they, the, the last floor, whereas where the charter school, they took the gates down and they gave them flat screen TVs and they threw out all the old chairs and they were still workable, but they threw them out and gave these kids comfortable chairs. Um, the colors in the hallways, the, the bulletin boards, the, um, the lighting, the whole structure was so different, so warm and welcoming. And yet when you went to the floors that I was still working on, how different they were, that we were just, just describing the jail-like mentality uh, uh, that didn't change. And I just said, well, how is this possible that this funding created for one school and not for an entire school? Because we're talking about children. We're talking about youth. We're talking about our babies. And how it was so disturbing to me that I was taking pictures and sending it to parents and said, get angry, get angry, get ready. Let's start fighting because this is not right. Funding should be for all our kids. And if there's something wrong as a community, as a village, we should be angry and getting together and do something different to make sure that these things happen for all our children. Thank you for joining us, uh, Gilly, David, Gloria. Thank you. Anna. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us as well for the second episode of Our Home, Our Haven, Safe Streets, Bronx Nets Forum on Preventing Gun Violence. We will see you on our next episode for more information about innovative gun violence prevention actions and the people working to safeguard our communities.